Today's comment comes from QWERTY00. Don't usually comment on anything, but we'd be interested in more ramble videos, particularly a more in-depth take on Japanese music since you couldn't really get into it here. Music it is. Japanese music gets pretty deep. Without further ado, this is round two of Tokyo Scramble Rambles. <laughs> Tokyo Scramble Rambles, I will take 15 minutes and see how deep I can dive into various topics about Japan, Japanese culture, Japanese language. I'm a little worried about today. I'll be diving into music, but to be honest, I'm not sure how much justice I'm going to be able to do the uh, you know Japanese music in 15 minutes, though I will do my best. So here we go. Uh, Tokyo Scramble Rambles Part 2, all about Japanese music. 15 minutes in 3, 2, 1... Uh, let's do it. Um, where to begin? <laughs> Almost every uh, story uh, dealing with Japanese music finds its roots in the legend of Amaterasu and the cave. Uh, the cave is actually a real cave that you can find in Miyazaki and uh, known as uh, Amano Iwato. So you could visit this cave if you ever wanted to. Um, the story goes, a legend has it, that um, Amaterasu and her younger brother, Susano no Mikoto, they get into some kind of fight or something. Um, Amaterasu is either angry or pouty or something. She decides to hide herself in a cave. This is a problem for the rest of the world since she's the sun goddess and the world basically falls into darkness. At this time, they start trying all sorts of different things to get her out of the cave and... Usually, the story involves song and dance and drumming and music of some sort, and thus also comes the birth of music in Japan. Um, most traditional Japanese music will, will trace its roots back to the story, whether it's uh, taiko. Uh, often, you know, drum players or percussionists will say that the first taiko was played by the younger brother to draw Amaterasu out of the out of the cave, and that's where it all began. Who knows? Um, organized music really, or at least like a record of organized music, really doesn't start coming into the history books until we hit like the late Nara period, uh, the Heian period. Uh, before that, you would have had a lot of music that was played in like local areas. There was different types of music, and music that still exists today, uh, known as kagura. Uh, kagura is just a type of music and dance that's essentially made to, it's a uh, religious, like a Shinto um, performance piece, like music that's meant to uh, being be pleasing to the kami, to the gods, and bring uh, peace and balance to everything living in the surrounding time space, the, everything that can hear the music or see the performance. Um, basically there to please the kami. Um, so every tiki, like every different area would have their own kagura and they'd have their own traditions, their own music, but none of this has really, there's, we don't really have a lot of records of this stuff. Um, as with most uh, musical traditions in Japan, Everything is word of mouth. Everything is literally written kuden. Like most of the music is transferred via kuden, which is written with the kanji for mouth and style to communicate something or transmit something. So kuden. Um, it's a verbal tradition. Uh, music, whether it's the structure of the music, the sounds that the instruments make. Uh, traditionally, there's no written music in Japanese music anywhere. So if you try to go back any further than the Nara period into history, you come up empty handed. We have stories that music existed. What did it sound like? To be honest, no one really knows. The reason we start um, knowing what music sounds like when we get into the late Nara period, Heian period, is because uh, we start getting into a form of music that we currently know as gagaku. Gagaku is the imperial, like the court music of, of Japan, of traditional Japan. And it is heavily, heavily influenced by 
uh, Chinese culture, uh, basically Chinese court music. <laughs> without getting into ancient politics. Um, so you get into the Heian period and early forms of Japanese music reflect really heavily um, kind of like a Chinese aesthetic. So if you look at uh, the drums, the costumes, the way, even the way that the court musicians organize themselves, you see a lot of parallels between the Chinese court music of the time and the Japanese court music that... Um, I wouldn't say they were copying because it's not a it's not a verbatim copy, but it was definitely heavily, heavily, heavily influenced by. Um, and uh, Chinese culture really was seen as like a, re a higher culture at the time. Um, so the imperial uh, family or the you know the higher classes they wanted to associate themselves with uh, with the Chinese culture at the time. Um, interestingly, and I guess because of that, there's a lot of like Taoist thinking and philosophy that affects like how people view the music back then um the you know the layout the structure everything is very square there's a lot of right angles um the designs are all very um you know they're, they're the same on the left and the right they're very balanced they're um and it, and it kind of all goes back to kind of like these taoist you know principles um Gagaku, at the time actually just known as Gaku, which just is written for the kanji, I mean, for fun, uh, was uh, really just court music. It was meant for like the highest people. But the reason we still have record of it is because it also came with kanji. It came with uh, this idea that they took from Chinese culture to write down, actually write down uh, their tradition, write down the music. And this is why... Um, Gagaku has actually been in its current form, even though it was evolving from like kind of proto Gagaku music, Gaku, um, you know, from the Nara period. Uh, it really takes its full form about 1300 years ago. And the music that we have now that Gagaku artists still play today is basically, it's more or less the same as it was 1300 years ago, which is an amazing feat. Um, and this is really due to the fact, uh, mostly, that Japan has been incredibly peaceful. Of course, it did have a, you know, different warring times, but those, the wars in Japan, the different civil wars, they, they dealt with uh, different clans, but no one was ever really fighting for the imperial throne. Uh, it wasn't like that. The, the political power that the different clans held, they, while they may have battled for that, no one was like trying to overthrow the, the imperial throne. And so court music that belonged in the, obviously, in the courts was really able to uh, maintain itself over the years. Um, since this is a Japanese language channel, uh, there are some really interesting things that come out of Gagaku. Um, if you've ever heard uh, words like, uh, if I say, choshi ga uh, kyo choshi ii jan, or, you know, like you're, you're, like you're doing good today, you're hot today, you're, you've got it going today, or kyo choshi wari, like, uh, it's just, it's not happening today, I'm not feeling it today, I'm not feeling good today. Uh, choshi, I'll put the kanji up here, um, is actually the name of a gagaku piece, a piece of music uh, that, that it's, it's actually a pretty long piece of music that instruments that um, uh, musicians used to play to kind of see how they were feeling that day. It was like a warm-up piece, a practice piece. So they would play choshi, this piece, and if it was good, that would mean that basically today they were feeling it. Today they had it going on. So choshi ga ii. But uh, you know, if people saw a musician who just like, they weren't really having a good day, they weren't having it today, they'd say choshi ga wari, choshi wari. And that's why now today, saying choshi ga ii, choshi ga wari has nothing to do with music in most cases. Uh, you're just talking about, you could be talking about watching your favorite baseball player on TV and just saying, la, choshi wari. Or you can say about yourself, like, nan ka kyo choshi yi. Uh, yeah, it's a big part of culture. There's all sorts of words that come from uh, like gagaku traditional music. Um, yatara, like, uh, yeah, he yatara jibun no koto kataru no ga suki, or something. 
like uh, this yatara is actually yatara is actually the name of a song um, that was played in a really difficult time signature. It usually flop back, go back and forth between being in three and two and three and two and three and two, which is really difficult to count. A lot of the um, uh, musicians would kind of get overwhelmed and the piece, it was really easy for this piece yatara to fall apart and kind of get in disarray because uh, it kept, it swapped signatures every other measure, three, two, three, two, three, two. So yatara now kind of means when you, it's like a little bit over, it's a little bit uh, too much. And it kind of has this feeling in the background, even though it's not really what it means, that it's it's almost too much that it's going to kind of fall apart. And, and that's, that's the original meaning, so yeah. Um, there's also a lot of concepts that came out of Gagaku that ended up uh, influencing like later forms of music. Uh, the, this concept of Johakyu is, is really important. Johakyu, also a song, uh, it's an idea of, of art or music in this case being broken down into three parts. Jo being kind of like a introduction that is slow. Um, usually there's no time, it's, it's like very free. So in most music, the, the Jo of Johakyu Maybe the beats on the taiko that you're playing are decided. Like you hit three times, and then you hit eight times, then you hit three, and then you hit eight. But the the spacing is not in time. So you play dong 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 dong. You're just playing. It's kind of random. It's not like in time. And then uh, ha would be kind of like the main body of the piece. And this is like, uh, it's it's kind of like building the story, it's in time. And then Q, literally written with the kanji for like really fast, uh, that's like the fast, the exciting ending, the climax. So this concept of Johakyu comes from a gagaku um, musical piece, but uh, this idea ends up getting uh, transferred over to later forms of music as well as uh, other Japanese art forms that have nothing to do with music, whether it's like Ikebana, like the flower arranging, or Iaido, like with the swords, drawing of the swords, um, all sorts of stuff. Um, I could do 15 minutes on Gagaku, but I, I have like four minutes to hit the rest of Japanese music. So um, I think historically, there's kind of like three main types of Japanese music that really kind of uh, give you a peek into like the Japanese heart or the Japanese soul of music. Gagaku, after Gagaku, it, it um, music kind of uh, starts to make a space for it on the stage. And it would have been <coughs> uh, later in like the 1300s uh, that a very famous playwright um, known as Zeami, uh, kind of solidifies what we know now as no theater. Uh, he would have been the equivalent of like the Japanese Shakespeare. Um, no theater, uh, it, it really draws heavily on Buddhist um, influences. Uh, in some ways, Gagaku does as well. But I think that like no theater really starts to move uh, away. Well, I mean, you know, it starts to move into like more of a Zen uh, understanding of, of, uh, of Buddhism. And, and that kind of shows in the music. Um, it's really at this time that I think the Japanese sound solidifies itself, uh, which I think you can demonstrate. It has a lot of parallels to just modern culture in general. Um, if you look at some of the main instruments, well, the main instruments of no theater uh, being the no kan, which is like the no uh, flute made out of like bamboo. And then there's three different types of taiko. Uh, they have the kotsutsumi, which is the one they hold on the, uh, it's like an hourglass shaped drum that they hold on their uh, shoulder and they can adjust the pitch by squeezing and releasing the ropes on the side. There's the otsutsumi, which is held on the hip. It's a really high pitch sound. And then there's the, well, they say taiko, but it's a shime daiko, like a, a roped drum that's uh, played with sticks. Um, these are kind of like the core of well, the music of no theater, obviously along with the human voice. And I think this is really when kind of like the quintessential Japanese sound was established. Um, if you look at the development of the music, like uh, in, in Gagaku, there was an instrument called the ryuteki, which is like the, the main flute. And this flute, uh, to all the Gagaku people, I'm sorry, it, to, my, to me, it sounds kind of like a, a little more standard, like a, not like a recorder, but just kind of like a standard flute sound. 
Um, but with the development of the Nolcon, there's actually like another little piece inside of the mouse piece that how you can produce like a really high pitched sound, which you have to blow a lot harder. Um, and it really makes like this uh, unique uh, sound. Um, and I, I guess the point here for me is that Japan has always been kind of like this country of um, having to, they take something from another culture and then they make it their own and they make it even better. And the music really is the same way. I, I think it's the, you know, this uh, evolution of the ryuteki into the nokan is basically kind of like embodies this part of Japanese culture that's just super open to outside ideas. And, you know, there's really no wall. It just absorbs these outside ideas and then reproduces them as their own, only better. And that's something that you can see in modern day Japan with the car or the cell phone or computers or like really anything that Japan gets. Um, I'm about to run out of time and I have only uh, made it to barely touching on no the music of no theater. I'm gonna have to do a part two on this one. This has been part one, <laughs> part one of Tokyo's Carnival Rambles music. Uh, hang in there for part two. Um, I'll get that out there soon. Thank you. Have a good day. Tokyo's Carnival out.